Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Greenberg, GM of Advertising Week, and welcome to the Future of Broadcast. I want to thank uh, our partners at RTL Ad Connect for helping us cur curate this content today and having these wonderful panelists, as well as Kate, moderate the session. And with that, I'm going to get off and let the real uh, magic begin. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Uh, good morning. I'm Kate Bulkley. I'm an independent media commentator and journalist, and this is the future of broadcast session, decrypting what multi-platform content means for advertisers. Yeah. A couple things. We're doing questions on Slido. If you don't know what Slido is, it's on your app. You go in there, you put in questions. I see the questions on the monitor. We'll do that at the end. So bring down the Slido app and put your questions in there because we're not going to do the hands up mic thing, right? So that's that. Um, let me introduce our panelists and then we'll get going, all right? Um, next to me, I have Steve Ford. He is Director of Marketing and Experience for Online at ITV. Next to uh, Steve, we have Kim Yunus. She is Marketing and Innovation Director at M6 Publicité. She's come in from France. She has braved the gilets jaunes. Thank you very much. <laughs> next to Kim, we have uh, Stephen Courubla. Cor Cor did I do it right? That's okay. Corrible. <laughs> My French is not so good. Corrible. Uh, Stefan is, um, he is the CEO of RTL Ad Connect, which is part of RTL Group. And last no but not least, we have Sam Glynn. She is VP Branded Entertainment at Fremantle Media. You might Fremantle. notice. Fremantle, Fremantle sorry. Media. Not media. Ooh, yeah. Fremantle. Mm. Apologies. You may notice that some of these companies are connected. There's an RTL theme going on here, right? You're not part of RTL. Oh, we're part of RTL Ad Connect. There you go. So You're we part are, of RTL we are connected. Ad Connect. Yeah, yeah. So the connection here is that they're all part of RTL Ad Connect, and some of them are actually even more integrated with RTL Group. Um, we're going to start with what does pre premium content look like in this new multi-platform world? We hear a lot about premium. We've heard about peak drama. We've heard about the rise of short-form content. What is premium content? Sam, I'm going to start with you. What is, what is premium now? The way we think at Fremantle um, about premium is we're here to create irresistible entertainment. And that entertainment is for an ever-changing audience. And uh, we've really got to be adaptive and, and keep looking at what the audience wants. And whether we're creating our big talent shows, such as Got Talent or Idol or X Factor, which are all on ITV and MCs, mm -hmm or whether we're creating our more disruptive dramas. So I don't know if any of you have seen American Gods or The Young Pope or Picnic at Hanging Rock. We, are, we class all of that as premium content. Um, and these are global hits. But I think the other way to think about premium is what do local audiences want? Because you have to tailor that content to local audiences and, and deliver them something that might be a little bit smaller but still premium because it's unique to their needs. Would you agree? Well, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe Kim can come in here because premium, you know, we hear a lot about Netflix saying, oh, we do premium mm -hmm. dramas and Amazon saying we only commission premium, unscripted and scripted. <laughs> when you think of premium, Kim, what are you thinking about? Yeah, I think it's interesting. When I hear Samantha talking about these impactful programs, there is something you can feel about premium. There's a sense of quality in production, in direction. And you're right, it can come from anywhere. In fact, anyone today can produce a good campaign, tell a good story, put it on the, net the networks, you know, and it can work. Mm -hmm. So there must be something else with premium content providers. And I think uh, it lies in, uh, in two assets, in fact. The first one is control. Anyone can produce a good content once. It's a different matter to be able to do it every single time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in full mastery of the process. And that's what content, premium content providers can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also a number of guarantees that they can provide, guarantees that are audited in France by the CSA, which is the equivalent of the, uh, the outcome. You know? uh, I'm thinking of uh, the respect of human dignity, the honesty of the information, and you know it, it's particularly important today with fake news, yep. uh, the respect of young audience. Uh, so control, to me, is very important to premium contents. And, it goes and there's another thing also that is important to it, uh, that is less evidence. It's linked to the notion of brand equity. brand equity. I think we have it at ITV, M6, and Fremantle. Mm -hmm. What does it mean, brand equity? Every major brand, every premium brand, uh, conveys uh, a certain number of values in terms of familiarity, relevancy, capacity for innovation, a uniqueness. For instance, when I watch a program on M6, 
It looks familiar, even if it's new, because it is shaped the M6 way, which has been into a household for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So quality, of course, is very important and the, the ability to create emotion, but also control and brand equity. This it's, is the vision of content yeah, I, sorry, I, 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 It's sort of like the branding around it. It's almost like there's a wrapping around Completely, content, completely. I, right? I think brand is so important in a fragmented kind of landscape, mm -hmm. it, um, particularly in TV. For a long time, people have been talking about kind of what is, what is a channel brand? Is it going to be useful in a kind of on-demand mm -hmm. world? Actually, it's really useful. It's the prism through which people are making viewing choices. Mm -hmm. if, a, you know, if a drama is on a certain channel or on a kind of certain network, viewers will make a decision based on actually is that channel kind of does it do something for me channel 4 does something different to what itv does and they'll kind of deal with the subject matter in a different way so channels are really important and the and the, and the wrapper through through which people are making those decisions and do you really think that people still think about channels now i mean particularly in this fragmented world we're moving into where pieces of content seem to be floating on all kinds of platforms they may end up on youtube they may end up somewhere else are they really thinking oh that's on bbc that's a bbc one show absolutely i think they are i think particularly when it comes to looking at things with netflix or itv or bbc people deal with subject matters in different ways channel 4 will like i say will deal with a will deal with the drama in a different way to say itv would and i think people do use those channel uh, channel markers or those brands as a way of being able to decide whether that's something for them whether they're going to commit that hour to it or not um, so I think it is a really useful device for them. Mm -hmm. But do you not also think that people are just um, searching out content agnostically, that they're looking for a piece of content, they don't mind where it's come from? So for us, you know, we, we put Got Talent or X Factor on any country in the world, and you can switch on the TV in Mongolia, and you know it's, it's that show. So Yeah, uh, completely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. There is, there is mm -hmm. still the, the programme... The program title is still really, um, you know, really important. But look at um, look at Bake Off in the UK. It moved from um, from BBC to Channel Four, um, but the you know everyone didn't go with Bake Off. Not the whole audience didn't go over to Channel Four. They they saw a different program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily just about entirely about the program brand. It's mm -hmm. about the, the, those channels as well. Yeah. To touch on that one, I, I, I must say. I, I don't agree totally with you, Samantha, but I understand, you know, the focus is premium content, and I agree with you, this is a prerequisite. But then uh, there are two other things that are important for us at Broadcaster. It's editing <laughs> and packaging, in fact. Editing is still important because being able to make a selection of programs that, are cons that is consistent, that makes sense for the viewers, uh, is something that is very much appreciated for viewers. Mm -hmm. In fact, we tested it with some research. This is something people love about television, you know? Uh, the fact that don't, they don't have to make a choice. Uh, last week, I was affected by a, a piece of research that said people are depressed when they have to look for content like an hour or an hour and a half, two hours on platforms, you know? They make them depressed. Why is that? <laughs> it's the FOBO syndrome. Fear of better option f syndrome, you know? I choose this content, but maybe there, there is so something we, else so that is more interesting and so I'm missing it. So we've moved on from fear of missing out to <laughs> fear of better options. Absolutely, I absolutely. Think. And so when you do this editing, <laughs> you know, people are leaned back. They are relaxed. They don't have anything to take care of. We do that for them. <laughs> and then the second thing, packaging, what is that? Mm -hmm. It's the platform you put your contents on, and it's important. Mm -hmm. If I go now to a premium makeup store, I expect to get a premium packaging, you know, for my premium rouge élève, right? Mm. It's the same in broadcast. Mm. In TV, you have no problem because everything is so immersive, so visible, so qualitative. In the digital world, it's not the same thing. And that's why at ITV, I think it's the same. We replicated this experience, this TV experience, with uh, our digital online service. So Stefan, that's a perfect time to bring you in. Obviously, consumption is changing, right? And this is throwing kind of what I would, what we'd say in English, a monkey wrench or a spanner into the works. Um, as consumption changes, as people watch programs on different platforms, yeah. maybe they get it on catch up, maybe they get it on linear, maybe they get it on SVOD, maybe they get it on you know, YouTube later on. As a, how do you function in that environment? How do you connect audiences with advertisers considering that the audiences are all over the place? So, um, so thank you very much for the uh, intro here. Um, well, at RTL, we consider that TV means total video. So we uh, changed a little bit the acronym a few years ago. So why total video? Because we think that uh, you know, content is not only consuming on the big screen, different screens, different devices, in linear, nonlinear, uh, at different moments in time. So we need to, to take 
into consideration those changing in, ter in, in, in terms of consumption from, uh, from the consumer's perspective. So um, I'm, I'm very happy here to, of course, to represent all these guys or also from a production company. And every day we are touching in Europe 165 million viewers when we're combining all those different you know, broadcasters uh, at RT and at Connect. And I can tell you within the total video day, meaning linear TV, SVOD, catch-up TV, YouTube, uh, uh, vi uh, uh, online video consumption, I think linear TV is still at the very core of it. We're still consuming nearly four hours a day of linear TV, so it's big. Uh, it's, <laughs> linear TV is still very big. Mm -hmm. Of course, some additional stuff are, are coming, like online video, catch-up, BVOD, or online video on YouTube. And at RTL, we are combining those different uh, types of consumption. And we have put on the market last year a, uh, a very a new initiative, I would say, which is combining all those different uh, um, consumption. So, so we are combining within what we call our video marketplace. So the BVOD, so the catch-up TV platforms of MCs, Cis Play, Broadcast VOD, uh, ITV Hub, Rye Play, uh, TV Now in, in Germany, plus all the inventory uh, that we are uh, delivering on platforms like YouTube from Fremantle, you know, short clips of X Factor, uh, American Idol, or uh, Got Talent on YouTube. And we are combining this into one big marketplace in order to make sure we're offering our uh, advertiser an alternative to just Google or Facebook on online video. No, and are the advertisers happy with that? I mean, they, do they see that it's premium content, so they're happy to advertise, let's say, on linear as well as BVOD, as well as, you know, some kind of SVOD type service or not? Well, I, I think there is a, a strong appetite for that mm -hmm. um, from a, uh, you know, additional reach perspective. Uh, but also from a uh, brand safety perspective. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're aware of, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, the WFA, the World Federation of Ad Advertisers, they uh, published a charter on, you know, good behaviors in terms of online video and putting forward the fact that they need to be closer to the content, they need to be closer to premium content, which is exactly what we are offering, and they need to make sure that we are taking the brand safety uh, topic uh, at a very high level. Mm -hmm. and, and viewability. And the viewability as very well. Very important. And I do believe that you know, the broadcasters and Fremantle are ticking all those boxes mm -hmm. uh, from a WFA perspective. So I think uh, we still have some work to do, but the strong appetite for, for that type of offer uh, uh, will be more and more, uh, or will, will, will grow even more in the, in the, in the next month. Let's talk a little bit about SVOD because we've talked about advertiser VOD because that's basically the main focus that we're talking about here. But the rise of subscription VOD is starting to really change the playing field. I mean, let me just start with you, Steve. In, in the UK, BritBox was announced, what, 10 days ago by your CEO. There's still not a lot of detail around it, but <laughs> the idea is that you will have some kind of SVOD subscription VOD yep. offering with some archive and maybe some commissions at some point down the line. How does that fit into how you think about content or how you think about the customer journey or the viewer journey? Yeah, sure. The, the, like, I, like I said, I can't give too much away on BritBox. Um, it's a developing and kind of moving train at the moment, so and there's lots, lots, lots of uh, moving parts to it. But we, at, at ITV, we've got three great products in the market at the moment. Um, Linear TV, which is still by far and away the biggest platform for viewing. I agree with what Stefan was saying before. Um, you know, ITV grew share and grew volume last year, and, and that includes 1634s, uh, 1624s, younger people watching it. Um, we've also got a scaled up um, BVOD platform in, in the hub, uh, where we can do targeted advertising. And we've got a um, Hub Plus, which is a, a kind of small percentage of people who pay a monthly uh, rate to us to remove the ads. We've now also got to launch um, uh, an SVOD service, which will be um, after it's finished, after, after the program is finished on iPlayer and on the hub, it will be made available as a box set in perpetuity on there. So we see those being as, as 
there's four great products. If you want to watch in the moment... Your, you're actually going to keep the ITV Plus. The, uh, uh, yeah, that will all be there, yeah, because oh, the, the, the first three really are about so in the windows. moment. Well, they're okay. about in the right. moment viewing. So if you want to watch linear TV, and the vast majority of people yeah. do, they, they, can, they can continue doing that. Um, if you want to watch in your convenience, then you can do that through Hub, and then Hub Plus, we can remove the ads. Yeah, but um, that's interesting, because the Hub Plus, the removing the ads, sounds a lot like SVOD. Well, that, not necessarily because it's not a content play. There's no additional ah. content in there. There's no okay. exclusive content. So it's, it's just a, you. It's just exactly you the same thing. So, and, and when we look at our segmentation of, um, of, of Hub and Hub Plus, it is soaps viewers. It is Love Island viewers. Okay. It's, it's Britain's Got Talent viewers and, and sports viewers. All programming that mm -hmm. people want to mm -hmm. um, keep up with the narrative on in the moment, currency, to be able to talk to people the, the, the following day about. SFOD is, is another window for us, another opportunity for us where in the past people won't have had the opportunity to get access to that content. Maybe through Netflix, some of the stuff that was on there, but it'll be the, the first time that a complete set of British box sets will be available for the viewer beyond the, uh, the catch-up window. So Kim, in France, there's the same kind of thing happening. I think it's called Salto, mm -hmm. which yeah, is also, kind of they're yeah. trying to get a bunch of broadcasters. So ITV is working with BBC and they are hope, hoping also to work with Channel 4 here. So what is Salto about? How far along is it as an SVOD service? Mm -hmm. And as, a, as somebody who's thinking about advertising supported TV, which is where you're coming from, where does that fit into the mix for you? Well, uh, as TV, I cannot tell m more much about Salto because it's still developing and it's under uh, the study of the, the authorities. So mm -hmm. what I can say is that We've been trying to build alliances over the last five years, I would say. Uh, Salto is an example. It's a content alliance. We have other kinds of alliances, and especially in the advertising field. For instance, four months ago, we launched Sigma, which is a an alliance with the same players, TF1 mm. and uh, France Télévision in France, uh, which are our main uh, competitors and allies, uh, just to be able to sell our uh, targeted advertising, so with data, uh, within a secured way, within one DSP that is very secured uh, to make sure we don't get uh, data leakage or that kind of thing. Right. So this kind of strategy, alliances, is something uh, that is more and more relevant for us because of competition, of course. We want to promote television. As Stefan said, it's still four hours a day, four hours a day in France. It's 85% of total video consumption, 85%. Uh, SVOD is four persons, so it's still massive. And even among young population, population aged from 25, 15 to 34, mm. the consumption, TV content stands for 70% uh, of total consumption, so it's still big. And our goal is to make this offer available on all support, digital platforms, linear and everything, mm -hmm. uh, but still uh, in a secured way for viewers and for advertisers. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about addressability and targeting, because that's obviously huge. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that you've, ha you've created Ad Connect, basically, is to have this ability to target and do programmatic and things like that. How far along is that, um, Stefan? I mean, um, I know what's at stake is, of course, huge because it's trying to, you know, monetize that audience. But how far along is it? It seems like, you know, it's taken a while to get this going. So, well, I, I think there is a change of paradi paradigm. Uh, as we said, you know, the uh, consumption of, of TV as a whole, total video, is, is evolving. So we switch from, you know, viewers to users. Um, from a uh, you know from a device point of view, so you know the, our uh, customers are everywhere uh, and basically using different devices. So you need to take care uh, in, or to take into consideration those acts. And um, you know, thanks to technology, uh, of course, we have many ways of uh, uh, targeting more a specific audience. Uh, thanks to uh, yeah, addressable. Um, in Europe, addressable is a little bit. Complex, you know. If you look at the U.S., you know it's uh, it's more of a uh, ecosystem on its own. When you look at Europe and the different countries, of course, you have different ways of uh, uh, of you know um, making or using addressable TV. Uh, in the U.K., you have AdSmart, very much uh, developed. Uh, if you look at, uh, at Sky is AdSmart. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. Sky AdSmart. If you look at at France, uh, it's a high a lot of um, you know it's a very much uh, focus on IPTV and HBBTV. If you look at Germany, it's very much HBBTV. Um, so uh, 
uh, within the group, what we're trying to do, and we think at Antiel at Connect that it will be in the future some kind of a combination of those different uh, capabilities. Um, we've been experiencing very high uh, and very good return on HPB TV. I've, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it. It's it's a connected TV devices. You know, it's on the smart TVs, on right? The smart it's TV. It's basically a yeah. software that's on the smart TV. It's exactly. And people, it just it shows up. If you buy a new smart TV, there it is, right? Yeah, and you, yeah. you, we are able to target up to the household level, and uh, you know, at the moment in in Germany, for instance, you have a very high level of penetration of around, you know, 20, 20, uh, 23 million uh, households that are. Uh, HPB TV enabled, and uh, we've been conducting a lot of tests, a lot of campaigns, uh, in order to uh, you know to uh, uh, to value uh, the power of addressable TV. And and to be honest, this is the grail that uh, all advertisers are looking for. We're not there yet in all countries, but we are learning a lot. And I think in, it's starting now in uh, in France with HPB TV with a lower level of penetration, and uh, and Spain is following as well. So we're now able to use HBB TV in those three countries, mm -hmm. and maybe in a few uh, months from now, UK will be uh, will be uh, using it as well. I think Freeview is using it. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're developing the software at the moment. So uh, yeah. everyone, it's, a, it's a basically a browser that goes over the top of a of a TV stream. So anyone who's got a connected TV could put a uh, HBB TV uh, browser over the top of it, which means you can replace advertising. You could actually replace programs if you wanted to as well. So you could kind of do different regionalization within it. Um, I think for us at ITV, we've got kind of a mix of kind of two worlds. We've got mass simultaneous reach through our TV platform, mm -hmm. and now coupled with really kind of large. Uh, audience um, that we can drill down into segments on the hub so we can do really um, laser targeted advertising on the ITV hub at scale so you know we've got the, the kind of best of both worlds in terms of kind of that, 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 that mass simultaneous reach that TV gives you there's no better media to be able to drive um, awareness of brands but then also then couple that with um, the targeting that you can do with, with, with data driven um, uh, initiatives. It's interesting what you just said, and I'll, I'll come to you in a second. That one of the questions that came on from Slido, which I think is relevant to this, so I'm going to bring it up now, is the, the questioner is asked, are there less water cooler moments, or there seem to be less water cooler moments in TV? And how do you, you know, as we go into targeted, yeah, no, I agree, you know, I agree. targeted, um, you know, down to the household or down to the individual, it all sounds great. You know, what, hap what, about, the, what about that water cooler moment? Oh, well, and look, 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 look I, you know, um, the England, the England game last year, the, the kind of the goal that was scored and, uh, and uh, that was kind of a big water cooler moment. Bodyguard, uh, I'm a celebrity last year, um, Love Island. I mean, I can't, can't kind of, there's, there's multiple kind of times, um, Lost Voice Guy winning BGT. You know, they're all kind of massive, massive moments. So I kind of disagree with the question, actually. I don't think, I think TV is still delivering huge amounts of water cooler moments. You don't really tend to hear someone come in. I mean, Netflix, everybody's at different stages in their kind of narrative with it. So there's no real water cooler moment with that. And, or if there is, often there's, there's a person who's out of the equation on it. They're not kind of, they're behind or, you know, spoilers or something that's kind of, that's not kind of, that's a bit frowned upon. Whereas these big TV moments, the ones, some of the ones that I've just mentioned then, are just, are just, are just huge within it. So I, I, this idea that, there's, that, uh, that TV is delivering less of those big water cooler moments, I don't really agree with. I mean, Sam, can I bring you in quickly? Sure. Because this idea of, um, you know, a water cooler moment isn't necessarily the moment. In other words, the water cooler moment can kind of happen in different moments. It's, I mean, this idea of spoilers become a huge thing online. You know, people no, are like no. very careful about, you know. So how does, what is the water cooler mo moment in a multi platform environment? Well, multi-platform helps water cooler moments. So there might be a piece of content on TV, but once it's shared and loved on social media, then it just grows and gets momentum all around the yeah, world. Exactly. So for example, we, we had this clip. It was an audition clip from Asia's Got Talent, and it was an Indonesian female magician. And somehow this clip, uh, went global and it was so huge that it became the biggest ever video on Facebook around the world. So that became a water cooler moment that grew global and grew outside of its native territory and has lasted for months and months and months and it's still very, very highly viewed. So water cooler um, isn't just this big anymore, it's, it's huge. I think that's the way to think about it. We're, we're part of a global, global water cooler movement. <laughs> yeah, I think when you, yeah, I, was, I was talking kind of UK audience, yeah, yeah. You can, but, but uh, you know, from, from, from us, the, the, those big water cooler moments then do drive other viewing 
on, on, on say the hub or kind of iPlayer or mm -hmm. wherever you want to go and watch it. That they, those big moments where everybody's talking about it. If you have missed them, then you will go, you will go and seek them out, whether that be a short form kind of look at it or whether it be kind of you watch the whole program. Yeah, because the water cooler, people are chatting on social now. It's about the commenting, yeah. it's about sharing, it's about talking to your friends about it. It's about doing the challenge on TikTok uh, that, that replicates it. So it has this, this ripple effect, which is much to use my water imagery, which is much bigger than it ever was before. <laughs> <laughs> so Kim, when you see the, yeah, the linear TV <coughs> falling, I mean, is, does that not worry you? Because you've got this water cooler moment has become moment, 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 moments. They come Yeah, but just to, to go back on what Stefan was saying, uh, and, and Steve as well, on addressable TV, what's at stake here? I think it's, it's very important just to have it in mind. Uh, television stays uh, a mass media, and this is good because that's uh, an asset for advertisers. Mm -hmm. They need to get uh, instantan instantaneous reach, great reach for their campaigns. Mm -hmm. That's what builds sales uh, very rapidly. So we need to keep this. But at the same time, while uh, social media and digital media in general can offer very precise targeting, the question, the fact that television has so limited targeting capacity today is a problem. Why is that? Because there's a lot of waste, right? In television, that's how the media is built. There's a lot of ways for campaign, for, for brands, because you reach your target, but you reach a lot of other people that don't need to see your advertising. And for broadcasters, of course, because there, there's a great loss of inventory. So why is it a problem now? Because we cannot afford that waste anymore. Because, as we mentioned, the TV viewing time is decreasing. Even if it's still big, we know that the trend is here. And so we need to yield our inventory more efficiently. It's a simple equation. To maintain your revenues, you, you, you can play on prices or you can play on volumes. Now, if you take, for instance, the landscape in France, over the last decade, the time, uh, the, the ad time per day has gone from two hours a day to three hours a day. 50% increase, mm. so it's big, mm. you know? Well, In the end, being able to build addressable TV that's more efficiently. That's television. Yes, for television. For linear because television Because prices have been going television. down with competition mm. from the digital world, right. broadcasters have had to adjust, you know, the volumes, and now we've reached the legal time. So we cannot put more advertising, and it's good because viewers don't want more advertising. They want more relevant advertising. So in the end, addressable TV is good for everyone for brands because they will target more efficiently their consumers, for broadcasters because we will yield inventory and not offer contacts that are useless for free. So in the UK and for viewers. Yes. So in the UK we've got this dovetail project which is basically trying to get addressable on linear television. I assume you had the same kind of project in France. How far along is it because we haven't quite gotten there in the UK in terms of delivering addressable, targeted advertising on linear Yes, television. of course. Well, uh, absolutely. In France, it's not authorized at the moment because it's not authorized by the law. It's not it's, authorized? No, 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 it's not authorized. It's the same in, uh, as in Germany. Is that going to change? But, well, we, yes, we are very much hoping so. Mm. We've been discussing with the government and we know, uh, we are hoping that the law will change by the end of the year, in fact. So we are preparing. We if are it getting ready with all the yeah. broadcasters. I mean, if it doesn't, them. Stefan, this is a huge problem for the industry. I mean, you know, Facebook, Google, they're all targeting like crazy. We've got to be able to target. That's clear. Um, but I think, so there are some ways of targeting via linear TV, but there are ways also of uh, targeting via OTT that we didn't, we didn't mention here. Uh, and I, I, I believe in, uh, in uh, ITV is doing it. You know, we're streaming mm -hmm. the live uh, feed of ITV online. And of course here, you can also uh, target or uh, do some ad stitching Yep. Uh, using technologies yeah. like YoSpace or you know whatever uh, company uh, in order to, to to make sure that we are changing the uh, the ads or the linear ads within the linear feeds, but adapted to the to the right audience which is watching on uh, online, and I believe this will be also something that will grow in the future. So it will be on OTT, it will be on linear TV thanks to either HPV TV or IPTV or cable technology, whatever is. Uh, available in each and every country. How far think. behind is TV right now? How far behind? How far behind? Well, is I wouldn't TV? say it's behind. You know, uh, I think TV is really reinventing itself every day. You know, it's a uh, food of innovation. You know, look at those uh, people we, we here do in offer, terms of development. We do terms offer of targeting that is yeah. more specific than yeah. when we used to. We can integrate uh, external mm -hmm. panels, mm -hmm. consumer panels, to build Great. that kind of targets. Yeah. Yeah. But 
there's still much room for yeah. progression. It's not necessarily just about um, about targeting either. So there's, you know, ITV last year had, um, did some great stuff with product placement, and there's some really good creative stuff that we do. You know, last year we did the biggest uh, product placement uh, thing in the, in the uh, that the UK has seen. It's uh, we we put a co-op in the in Coronation Street, and we put Costa in Coronation Street. Yeah. And you know, it, it, but those things feel natural to the yeah. to the viewer. That's what would be on a normal street. Right, right. So it's uh, you know, and, and you know, there's, there's other ways to be able to be able to innovate. That's beyond data. Like I say, TV is about mass simultaneous reach, you know, and then you can couple it with kind of with, with other targeting around it. So Sam, can I bring you in there? Um, you know, how is content changing? Uh, how does it impact because of these multi-platforms? You know, Steve just brought up, you know, sort of integration with brands and well, uh, you know, sort of high level product placement, let's put it that way, as opposed to, you know, not very good product placement, good product placement, but brands are desperate to get closer to Absolutely. customers. So how uh, is it changing? Well, we get more and more brands coming to us who want to be inside our shows, whether it's our entertainment shows or more and more our drama shows, our daily soaps, because they want to be part of the story. And it's, it's that idea of being involved in characters that people love and storytelling that people are absolutely involved with and being part of the big emotion, which you're never going to get in an ad. So, you know, we, we do about three, 400 brand integrations around the world every year. And that seems to be growing rather than, uh, than than decreasing. And I think part of it is, you know, they're not sure that advertising always works for their specific message. But more often than not, we'll have a brand that will be inside the show in, in part of a storyline. And then they'll advertise with the broadcaster around the show. And then they'll buy our YouTube inventory um, when the clip goes online. So they've got this 360 solution to really have double impact. So I'm sure Kim will have some statistics mm. about <laughs> the impact yeah. of an advert yeah. plus video content in, inside, inside the show. Yes. It's positive. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you think of an example or not really? Uh, well, uh, France, that's that worked. It's difficult for them. It's difficult for them, okay. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it always works for us and we get, you know, what I like is brands come back to us year after year and season after season and territory after territory and they, they scale with us uh, because they see the success, um, which, which isn't always measured by people clicking to buy, but more by brand enhancement, brand uplift. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, an empathy with the brand. We had a great we had a great success with um, Suzuki and um, and Saturday Night Takeaway, and we just moved into um, Take That and Suzuki as well. So it's been a brand partnership we've had for a long time, and it's really worked well with them. I think if, if with branded content, I think the biggest thing is to make sure it fits very neatly with the editorial, or it's a kind of part of the editorial. If it's not, it just feels right. wrong, and people don't want to engage with it because it just doesn't feel quite right. And getting the talent right and the and the, and the idea and the creative right, it really kind of makes that thing. Fly. Is that what you're seeing as well? That they well, want from an international perspective? Yes, you know when you look at the product portfolio of mm -hmm. you know from 30 second spot to uh, online video or sponsorship or brand integration, we see that um, there is a growing appetite from uh, from advertisers and brands to be very close to the content. Why? Because it creates engagement uh, from uh, from the viewers with the brand. So. Uh, I, I really completely follow what you said, both of you. You know, you need to be close to the content, but you need to be to make it in a way where it's, you know, it feels comfortable. It doesn't feel like, well, mm. here's a big big like board, here's a big integration, yeah. a nice can on a, I don't know, on a whatever table. <laughs> you know, it needs to be well done. Uh, they drink it nicely. <laughs> they, oh, drink they can drink it too. <laughs> um, yeah. Make sure the brand's facing the camera. Yeah, and I think, and I, and I think we're, we're facing, uh, you know, some other challenges when when it comes to Europe because, of course, not all countries are equal. You know, if you look at France, for instance, you cannot do that. You have to do it outside the show. Yeah. So there are plenty of ways. You can do it in fiction. Oh, in fiction, yeah. yes, but with a, with a show a, like yeah, Fremantle, yeah, you cannot, you cannot yeah. do it. You, you have to do it outside the show. Plenty of creative ways of doing it, but that raises the complexity of level of complexity yeah. when it comes to Europe, you know, from an international advertiser's yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, so then you need to be, uh, to be aware of what's going on in, each, in every country. But definitely uh, a strong appetite for brand integration more and more. One topic we haven't gotten to yet, I want to spend a little few minutes on, and then I'll go to some more of these questions. Yeah. Um, measurement. I mean, obviously we've, you know, measurement's a kind of the holy grail of, of all this. Um, how are we doing on measurement? Um, Stefan, can I start with you? I mean, how much of a disadvantage are, is linear TV still against Google or Facebook in terms of measurement, or are we catching up, or where are we? 
I would say that we are in a disadvantage. I, I would say I the contrary. Yeah. They contrary. need to catch yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. They need to catch up. <laughs> they need uh, to catch up. They need to be a little bit more open as well. Yeah, that uh, would be nice. You know, we, we, <laughs> we're using uh, you know, gold standards uh, from a uh, linear measurement uh, system in each and every country you know, for many years. This is solid, solid uh, figures and, uh, and audited, solid, and audited by yeah. uh, you know third party, etc. When it comes to online, of course, then I, I couldn't say that you know, especially from the two big uh, uh, showrunners, yeah. uh, they're not very, very open. I, I just know, uh, just received this morning, you know, there is a an initiative in in Germany where uh, uh, YouTube is working with AGOF as well. So uh, we're going to see how how things are evolving uh, on that field. But I think it's one of the first. Initiative. What's, what's AGOF? Sorry. AGOF is the, uh, it's like the BARB. Here, oh, the BARB, okay, sorry. Uh, but yeah. in Germany, uh, here in, in the UK, it's BARB. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see many, uh, many initiatives hopefully coming. Uh, but, but, but of course, yes, it's about, you know, transparency, you know, I need to be a little bit more yeah. open. I think, we're, you know, we're, we're 100%. Transparency and quality as well. Transparency and quality. Yeah. We're, you know, we're 100% viewable, we're brand safe. And we're fraud free. Um, you know, can the can the can the can the others say that say the same sort of thing? And I think that's what we're looking for as a as a as a, as a kind of industry is is a sort of a level playing field mm -hmm. between ourselves and, and and kind of. Of course, they have, you know, masses and masses of kind of individual data points to be able to target people with. But actually, before before you do that, you know, you need to make sure that. It's, it is 100 percent viewable. It is fraud free, and it is it's brand safe, it's brand safe environment. And I think you know a lot of the online players can't really say that at the moment. Also, it's but more to touch on your point, I think it's in, it's very important what you're saying, and it's a competitive advantage for us. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about performance. We're not even there. We need transparent measurement. You know, just the fact to be able to measure viewability on platforms, completion rate on platforms, and they do not even offer that to advertisers. I think it's a real problem for advertisers because they want to be able to speak the, real la the, the same language. Uh, they want to be able to have the same metrics as they do have on TV, especially when we're talking about video, because in the end, you buy video on TV and you buy it on platforms. I think it's good to buy on platforms. It have some, uh, they have some assets, you know, for performance, for clicks and all that. It's just, we need to measure things the, 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 the right way. Also, it's about views, too. I mean, I, earlier we were talking, and I said, well, how, Kim, what do you think about the three-second view? The three-second? The three-second view. Well, in my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> you need a, a bit longer, a bit <laughs> just to understand what the brand is going to tell you, just to understand the product. Right. I don't think you could get it in three seconds. Yeah. And actually, we, we found it you know, with research. We've done testing to do that. Mm. So a couple of questions that come off here. I love this one. What's the answer to FOBO, that sphere of, um, of other options, right? Uh, from a discovery perspective, as more people cut the cord, and what does that mean for broadcasters? So if, if you look at that, Steve, um, fear, you know, better options. How do you make sure that people aren't thinking, oh, it's a better option to go on Netflix, or it's a better option to go on YouTube, or... How, how does how do we keep the TV? I don't know. Well, I think cutting the cord brand in, high. Cutting the cord in the UK is slightly different to cutting the cord in the US. Um, you know, we we are a we, we have we have mass free to air broadcast. I think what they're talking about there is kind of is is more IP delivered households. Mm -hmm. And there is a small group of households that are kind of we, we've seen around about a million, a million and a half households in the UK who are who don't have an aerial in their TV, and therefore they're kind of they're getting their they're viewing via, via elsewhere. Actually, what that's doing for us, and, and what Netflix has done for us brilliantly, actually, in, is grown the market for for for, um, for uh, video on demand. It's now, it used to be kind of I worked at Channel Four before here, uh, before ITV, and it used to be that kind of that was that was uh, video on demand was a very it was the preserve of younger, more kind of early adopter crowd. Where it's now mainstream, you know, a lot of people are discovering Netflix and going in and then seeing actually the, all the other players are available to them as well. Uh, last year during the during the World Cup uh, and Love Island, we had the perfect storm which was quite difficult for our engineering team but we had um, over a million people <laughs> over a million people in our simulcast stream simultaneously so if you've got the content there people will come and discover it and find it so again it's back to this um, back to this kind of you know the quality programming and quality content so um, it's, it's, it's making sure that we've and we're, quality we're kind tech because of, you don't want it to fall over of course of course yeah, yeah exactly that was that, that was a real kind of uh, it was a perfect storm last year actually yeah, with uh, with England right. playing and the world and Love Island on as well yeah. um, but you know, if your content's there, then people will come and find it. Mm -hmm. Any other um, answers to uh, the FOBO question? I mean, 
do well, this. I, I agree with, with Steve. You know, it, it's, uh, Europe is really different from the U.S. You know, when you understand that in the U.S., in order to have a uh, TV subscription, you have to pay like 150 bucks, 150 dollars a month. So it's very expensive. That's, that explains a part or in part the success of Netflix with 10 to 15 dollars a month yeah. for a uh, all you can eat type of offer with free of ads. Uh, I think here it's different in Europe. I think the, the, the penetration of SVOD offers is still around 20 percent, which is growing, yes. Uh, and again, to come back with the uh, uh, the strategy of broadcasters like MCs or or ITV, and 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 from a production perspective as well, I think there is a uh, an opportunity for traditional broadcasters as well to be part of it. You know, to offer some uh, some things. I think the 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 differenti differentiator. It's a difficult word to say for me. <laughs> uh, or the added value we can bring versus a Netflix or an Amazon is the, uh, you know, the, the, the local content. Because when you look at Netflix, for instance, in, in Holland, you know, uh, high penetration of Netflix, you know, ab 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 nearly 30%, really big. Uh, but most of the content is US, mm -hmm. it's US content. And TV US content. And TV US content. So content only 5% of the, the catalog is really Dutch. Content. Yeah. When that you look will, at that, I mean, I don't mean to be a devil's advocate. That will probably change. I'm just saying because they're starting to. It will change from a European locally. perspective. Yeah. I'm not sure it will change from a local, market you know, market. kind of market yeah, to market. Yeah, you may be right. I think yeah. there's a window of opportunity. Let's put it yes. that way. We have to wrap up, but I'm just going to yeah. say there's one question here that says, "Do broadcasters need to consolidate and or work more clo closely together to fight against the online players?" Well, I think that we've we've shown here that they are working together. That's what that's the whole point, I think, of this panel. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they're all part of Ad Connect is really important because Stefan is able to sell right? Yep. Inventory across these various broadcasters across markets. Yes. And there are other groups like this that are out there. I mean, Channel 4 is in part in another group. So yes. the idea is that broadcasters are starting to think more collectively and working against um, some of these big online giants. Um, I really thought this was a very, you know, informative panel and I really thank you for being on it. Could you please join me in thanking our panelists, Kim, Samantha, Stefan, and Steve. Thank you. Thank you.